Hey everyone, welcome. This is uh, Eugene here, and today is episode 75 of Forensics Talks. My guest today is Gary Dunn, and he's going to be talking about the David Cam case, and specifically his book, which is Their Bloody Lies and Persecution of David Cam. And so we'll be getting to that in just a second. I just wanted to make one announcement before we start, and that had to do with the upcoming Forensic Photography Symposium. And so uh, many of you know, last year we had this, was the very first one. And this is where we're bringing together uh, forensic photography professionals from around the world to talk about some of the problems they face and how they solve those problems by using hardware, by using software, by using different types of techniques. And this applies to things like uh, autopsies to you know crash and collision investigation uh talking about photogrammetry drones 360 cameras um a whole number of different areas and i think you're going to be pretty interested in it we had a really great uh uh, set of people last year. So I'm hoping that if you're interested, uh, you'll join us there. It's coming up. It's just around the corner. Uh, the link is down here. So if you just go to the main website, the AI2-3D.com, you'll be able to uh, see the little link where it says FPS. But if you do slash FPS, it'll take you right to the pages. Schedule is up. We've got speakers up there. I've been posting a whole bunch of uh, the speaker, what I call the speaker series video. So just kind of giving you a little bit of background as to some of the different uh, topics that are going to be hit. So have a look there. I'll remind you at the end as well, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll see you. Okay, let me back out of that, and let's get started here. Now, um, before I begin, I always forget, uh, but make sure that you type in any comments that you have or anything like that. Always pleased to see people uh, from all over the world and where you're from. So if you go ahead and type in where you're from or, or where you're listening from, that'd be fantastic. And also along the way, make sure to put in any comments or if you have any questions for our guest, please type them in there. And what I'll do is I'll vet them and then I'll uh, present them to them as we uh, go along here. So uh, good. I got that out of the way because I keep forgetting to say that every time. So let's start with the, a quick introduction here. So Gary Dunn is a 27-year FBI agent with a wide array of experience investigating white collar, corruption, terrorism, and violent crimes. He was the lead private investigator working for David Cam's defense team. And it's probably an understatement to say that, you know, he was stunned by the lack of a fair justice system, uh, just how poorly the investigation was run, uh, bias with forensic experts, and, and a whole number of different issues that arose during the, uh, the investigation and the actual trials. Now, he published this book very recently, um, Their Bloody Lies and Persecution of David Cam, and it says part one under here. So that means I'm going to be expecting a part two. And in fact, uh, the book uh, we could talk about, you know, we will get into detail, but it basically covers like the first and second trials and um, a number of, of uh, details that you don't get anywhere else. So uh, the David Cam case is uh, has been featured nationally on Dateline, 48 Hours, uh, the Oxygen Network. There's other smaller things on YouTube that you can find, but none of those will go into the level of detail that you're getting here. Interviews, very specific interviews, a lot of specific questions and answers. And so uh, very, very interesting. Now, of course, I'm probably biased myself because I worked on the David Cam case, but I only worked on it in the third trial. And there were two trials uh, previous that were I guess they spanned, oh, they were they went over several, several years. So uh, when I got into it, I was kind of late to the party, let's say. But nonetheless, um, I met Gary at that point. And uh, we had, I remember having a lunch after uh, I had testified. And uh, well, let me tell you, it was extremely revealing. And I don't know if I believed him, uh, everything he was telling me, but sure enough, um, when you get into the details, a lot of this was extremely true. Now, also, uh, I should bring up the fact that I interviewed David Cam himself on the Forensics Talks program, and that was uh, episode 13. And so you could find that on YouTube if you want some uh, information. But of course, 
you know, even David Cam himself, um, you know, he wasn't on the outside. He was he was in prison. And so as a result, you know, getting Gary's perspective on this, I think, is going to be really important. So um, I will say this before we begin, and that is that, of course, you know, a lot of the comments and, and topics that are dis discussed here are based on Gary's research, uh, his involvement in the David Cam case and, you know, working with others um, who he interacted with, you know, both, both on the, uh, the prosecution and uh, defense side. So uh we'll we'll leave it at that and let me bring him in here and there he is hey gary how you doing hey uh, great uh, eugene uh, thanks for having me oh pleasure and thank you so much for for being here and sharing this um we're totally going to get into the book here in a second but i want to begin with you and i want to ask you about your uh, your your past life with the fbi which was a you know a, a fairly lengthy career. Now, were you uh, were you doing other stuff before the FBI or, or how did you get into the FBI? Oh, yeah. After I uh, I graduated from uh, Indiana University uh, uh, with a, a degree in secondary education, uh, I never utilized that uh, uh, because immediately after graduation, I, I uh, enlisted uh, in the United States Navy. I spent five years as a naval officer, uh, subsequently uh, got out of the Navy and went to law school for a brief period of time. And then my application to the FBI was accepted. And so I went to the FBI in 1976. Uh, my time there was spent first in Miami, Florida, uh, then several years in Chicago, uh, Northwest Indiana, Gary, Indiana, the resident agency there, and then finally uh, in Southern Indiana. Uh, and I have to say, uh, and, and, and this is important to me, uh, I was in Indiana for 18 years, and I worked very, very closely with the Indiana State Police, and uh, worked closely, worked well. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful organization. The, the people with whom I worked were sheer professionals, and and I have to say that because what I learned and saw and experienced in David's case involving the or the uh, State Police was uh, just the it, it was just the opposite, and it. It was shocking, uh, certainly for a person with my experience and relationship with the state police. Yeah, for sure. Um, what kind of cases or what kinds of things were you assigned to during your career with the FBI? Oh, it, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it was wonderful because I, I was fortunate enough to, to be in a position to, to work with uh, wonderful other uh, men and women, uh, great investigators uh, in Chicago. I was undercover for a year with a a major uh, uh, um, corruption investigation uh, involving both Chicago and New York City. Um, uh, Northwest Indiana uh, did a lot of property crimes, arson for profit, had uh, one case uh, in Chicago, uh, an arson case that um, uh, went to the Supreme Court and was upheld, our conviction was upheld uh, nine to nothing. Uh, rare that you get a unanimous decision on the Supreme Court, but, but we did. Uh, and, and then I did a lot of uh, property crimes, uh, worked with a wonderful friend, uh, colleague, uh, uh, John Novoselv with the Hammond Police Department, who was assigned to the uh, uh, FBI and Gary. Uh, we worked a lot of uh, arson for profit, uh, uh, property crimes, uh, car, uh, you know, uh, organized chop shops. Uh, and then, of course, in southern Indiana, worked, worked a lot of, uh, unfortunately, kidnapping, murder. Uh, a lot of violent crime, and of course, along the way, a lot of uh, uh, back when the FBI was uh, uh, working, a lot of uh, bank robberies did a lot of that, uh, and so I, I was very fortunate. I had a lot of uh, a lot of great experience with a lot of wonderful men and women over the years. Yeah, and and so it, what's interesting is, uh, of course, you you had retired. And like, so how much time had elapsed when, I mean, when you, when you retired, were you thinking you were going to go private? Were you like, yeah, I'm going to take some time off. Like what happened once you retired? No, no that, that was when, uh, uh, Ivy tech, uh, uh, community college in Indiana, they had, uh, 14 regional campuses and, uh, a good friend of mine, John Weichart, uh, was a chancellor of the uh, Bloomington campus where I was stationed at the time. And, uh, he asked me to, uh, uh, began the uh, criminal justice program at Ivy Tech in Bloomington, which I did and which I enjoyed. But after two, uh, less than two years, I, I really did miss the investigations. And so uh, in late 2004, uh, I uh, became a um, licensed private investigator in the state of Indiana. 
at working uh, what I would thought was going to be primarily uh, civil cases because I did have a lot of uh, uh, fraud investigation uh, experience. Um, and then um, uh, Catherine Lyle, attorney Kitty Lyle in Bloomington asked me to get involved in a in a voter fraud case, which which was not violent crime, of course. Uh, and I did so. And and I was um, uh, stunned about that case because the state of Indiana brought charges against a man uh, where there was no evidence. Uh, uh, it, 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 it was a rude awakening to what I had experienced uh, before. And, and then after we successfully resolved that, the charges were dropped. Uh, Kitty uh, asked me uh, if I'd want to get involved in another case. And I thought, well, well sure, what, what do you got? And uh, she said, David Cam. And I go, well, at least I'm thinking to myself, no way. Because uh, I had, had, as luck would have it, Dave's case was out of Floyd County. Um, that's where I was born and raised in New Albany, Floyd County, Indiana. And I thought, yeah, there's no way I'm going to get involved in this case. And, and as a, a strange twist of fate, the uh, lead detective uh, in Dave's case, uh, the first uh, investigation was Sean Clemens, uh, with whom I had been paired up in one of my last joint endeavors with the state police. And we had done a bunch of, uh, accomplished a bunch of uh, uh, searches, arrests, and a uh, major drug investigation uh, in um uh, Floyd Clark uh, County, Jefferson County, Indiana. And, uh, and uh, he told me at the time uh, that he was the case investigator on Dave's case and was very proud of the fact that uh, he had had an instrumental role in, uh, in convicting him. Uh, and I accepted that at face value. And I, uh, at the time Dave's case actually was occurring, I was involved in a, a kidnapping and we were sure a, a murder case of a IU co-ed, Indiana University co-ed, which unfortunately turned out to be accurate when her body was lady found, later found. But uh, and so I, I had no reason to question uh, the, the state's case or the fact that Dave was legitimately uh, prosecuted and um, and convicted. Right. So, you know, you this is like, I mean, you had you hadn't done like a ton of cases. You, you said, OK, I'm going to start doing work. And then she convinces you you know, to, to get on the David Cam case. And it's kind of interesting because I think in the book, like the very first, uh, in the prologue here, it's the dark side. And so you talk significantly in the book about the difficulties you had with trying to, you know, become David's investigator for the defense. And, and the fact that, you know, it was a, it was a difficult decision maybe because of what other people were saying or, or what. So I'm just curious about, you know, your feelings on that or your thoughts. Oh, on oh sure. It was, uh, and, and those weren't easily dissipated, far from it. Um, and I, I did not uh, commit to Kitty very easily. I, I wanted to do a little research myself. I did. I, I, I first read the uh, uh, Indiana Court of Appeals opinion, which said that unless uh, there, uh, 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 without the character assassination, I'm paraphrasing, uh, that occurred in Dave's first uh, uh, trial, uh, there was a good chance that he would have been acquitted. And that, that wasn't something I was prepared for. Uh, so, and I did a little more research and then, and I told Kitty, I let, let me look a little bit more. And finally, I, I came to the conclusion that there was a decent chance that Dave was an innocent person. And, uh, and, and, and so I got involved and, but I, I told her, and I told uh, Sam Lockhart, Dave's uncle, and I certainly told Dave when I met him that I was going to search high and low for any information, evidence that would lead to him. Uh, we, you know, we had a, a pretty easy mantra in the FBI, at least back in my day, and that was uh, let the evidence take you to your conclusion. Uh, there, there, you know, it, it seems today in all walks of life that the narrative is more important than the evidence, uh, than than the true story. And uh, and I never wanted that to happen to me. And it, it, you, you have to be careful because of that, uh, because people do uh, and, and are biased and, um, and maybe reach conclusions too soon. And I, I wasn't going to reach a, a, a quick conclusion that David Cam was innocent. I, I wasn't going to do that. The, the evidence was going to have to convince me that he was.
Right. It's, and it's a difficult thing to do. And, uh, you mentioned Sam Lockhart, who is uh, Dave's uncle and I had the pleasure of meeting Sam as well. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that gentleman is an absolute rock, uh, you know, a really, um, uh, I, I would say an honest person. And he, I remember him telling me, he said that if my nephew is guilty, he says, I'll be the first one to, you know, I don't think he said flip the switch, but to paraphrase, you know, he was saying, I'll be the first one to lock him up and throw away the key if he did this, you know what I mean? So, um, he, uh, yeah, yeah, was an honest person. Yeah. yeah. Seen, uh, as a, as a person of incredible integrity and character. Yeah, for sure. Um, can you, uh, I, there's people who have heard bits and pieces about the David Cam case, but could you quickly summarize what happened on, it was a Thursday night, September 28, 2000 at, uh, the David Cam residence. Sure. Uh, Dave, and I'll, I'll give you a little more background, a little more substance here. Uh, in uh, March of 2000, uh, Dave had uh, quit the uh, Indiana State Police as a road trooper. He'd been with them since 1989, a little over 10 years, uh, and gone to work for Sam at a uh, waterproofing and uh, foundation stabilization business. And, and he was doing very well in the six months uh, uh, that he had worked there. On September 28th, which as you suggest was a Thursday, uh, at a nearby church where Dave's um, uncle, Leland Lockhart, was a pastor. They had just finished a, a nice expansion, had a family uh, community center uh, with a large uh, full court gym. And uh, a lot of uh, men would play basketball there that evening. They'd start about seven and quit about nine. Uh, and that evening was no different. Uh, they normally wanted to have five on five full court, 10, 10 players. And, and so the previous week, they'd only had eight. So they've been calling around that earlier that afternoon. And uh, at seven o'clock, when uh, they normally started, a minute prior to that, at 6.59, was when the alarm had been disengaged by Jeff Lockhart. That would be uh, uh, Dave's cousin. And then within uh, uh, five minutes or so, they had their 10 num uh, min minimum uh, players show up. About 7.15 or so, Sam Lockhart, who was the oldest at the time, 55, he showed up. And so they had 11 players. By the time Sam showed up, the five-on-five the five games were in progress, full court. And uh, Sam's testimony has always been the same. Uh, he uh, watched, shot some hoops at the end of the uh, court where they weren't playing, uh, the game wasn't transitioning. Uh, and uh, about uh, shortly after eight, uh, the uh, the last game ended, and that's when he substituted for uh, Dave, and 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 the the five on five games had continued during the time that Sam had been the uh, uh, standing as the eleventh player. Well, shortly after eight o'clock, another fellow came in, and it was a um, elder of the church, Tom Jolly. Uh, Tom, who I've gotten to know over the years, uh, and and who interviewed and uh, early on. Uh, Tom had finished working uh, nearby a, a small farm of his and had, had driven to the gym and, and wanted to see how the gym was working out and, and came in when Dave was still playing basketball with the other nine. Uh, and then they transitioned. And by the time uh, Dave uh, did not play that game, he was on the sidelines, baseline with Tom Jolly. And uh, Dave and uh, one of uh, Tom's sons were, were close friends. So they talked about that. And then about 8.25, uh, another uh, player uh, decided to leave. Uh, that was when Dave went back in. So now you've got 10 remaining players, and they're playing five on five. At 9 o'clock, when they normally quit, um, some of the guys said, well, let's, let's play uh, uh, some more. Well, two guys left at that time. So now you've got eight players. And so then it was a four on four uh, quick games, and uh, they, they played for about 20 minutes. And the alarm was engaged at 922. So the time we got on one end is 659, 922 on the other. And during that entire time, David Cam was in that gym, uh, as witnessed by, by uh, so many people. Uh, at 922, Dave uh, leaves the, uh, or exits the gym and drives about three and a half miles to his home on Lockhart Road, which is, and this is important later, uh, which is a dead-end uh, gravel road in, in a semi-rural part of the county. 
he uh, he pulls into his um, to a shared driveway with his uh, an aunt lives behind uh, him with her uh, husband and eight year old daughter Hannah. Uh, he pulls into the shared driveway and then pulls into the his uh, garage, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, just off Lockhart Road. Uh, as he lifts the uh, there's a two bay garage. As he lifts the right side, which is uh, how he's going to get in. He sees on the floor there on a concrete floor a, a body and he initially thought it was uh, his daughter Jill. Now at that time uh, Kim Cam, uh, Dave's wife, 36 years of age, very smart, uh, savvy uh, lady, uh, worked as a um, in, in finance at a large insurance company in Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and they had two children, seven-year-old Brad and five-year-old Jill. So Dave, uh, the door comes up and he sees his body in the darkened garage. The lights aren't on and he races to it. And there's a huge pool of blood coming from what he then sees as Kim, his wife's uh, head. Uh, and as an aside, uh, I don't know if he notices it at the time, but Kim is, um, she doesn't have on any shoes. Uh, her shoes indeed are placed on top of the, uh, the adjacent Bronco, Ford Bronco that she had driven. And um, she's without her pants. She had on a white pair of pants earlier that day. And she's also clad in black underwear, black panties, which uh, didn't make an impression on anybody else except a, an arriving female trooper who immediately noticed that you're not going to wear black panties under uh, white pants. Uh, but anyway, back to Dave's, at this time, he's obviously frantic. He's thinking about Brad and Jill. Where are they? Uh, he jumps up and looks into the Bronco and uh, uh, is faced with uh, just a horrific scene. Uh, Five-year-old Jill is still strapped in her um, seatbelt in the back seat behind the passenger front seat, and uh, she's been shot in the head. Uh, and uh, he sees his son, who's behind the, the driver's uh, seat, and and Brad, it's he's draped over the back of the back bench seat uh, in in a manner that it's clear and it would be to anyone that he was trying to get away uh, from the shooter. Uh, all three uh, later, it's determined, have been shot. Uh, uh, Kim through and through the head of the bullet actually uh, hitting the interior of the uh, the windshield of the Bronco. Uh, Jill had been shot through and through the head. And uh, you could clearly see that path because of the downward path uh, through the back seat after it exited her uh, the rear of her head. And then Brad, who was the only one not shot in the head, uh, but and he had no visible blood. And, and Dave thinks, well, in his mind, of course, you can only imagine how this man's mind is racing. Uh, he thinks maybe his son has a chance. So. Uh, Dave uh, enters the passenger side. It's a two-door Bronco. Enters the passenger side, goes through the uh, the two uh, bench seats over the console into the bench seat. He grabs his son, embraces him, pulls him out, and lays him adjacent to the Bronco and starts performing CPR. Uh, and, and that, as we know, of course, is, was unsuccessful. Brad had actually been shot uh, in the torso, had severed a spinal column, and probably not lived, uh, but a few minutes of that. Uh, and of course, Joe and uh, Kim's uh, injuries would have been instantaneously fatal. Uh, so then um, he, he runs into the house. Uh, the, the, the garage is detached and there's a breezeway, uh, an open porch, uh, t uh, which connects the house to the uh, garage. He runs into the house. Uh, they didn't keep their uh, uh, house locked. Runs into the, uh, the kitchen, grabs a phone, and, and calls uh, the uh, Indiana State Police Salisbury Post, uh, where he had been assigned for about 10 years. Uh, and then he runs over and uh, across the, uh, the gravel road is his uncle, Nelson Lockhart, 35-year police veteran of the Kentucky State Police in Jefferson County, Louisville um, uh, Police Department. Uh, and uh, Nelson uh, races back over with Dave. Uh, Nelson was with his... Uh, 91-year-old uh, um, father at the time who was uh, quite feeble. Uh, and uh, 
Nelson sees what's happening, confirms that all three are dead, and then tells uh, Dave, hey, we got to get out of here. This is a crime scene. Okay. So that's, and that's yeah. Yeah. That's the start of, of where police arrive and there's all kinds of the investigation starts and, and, and all this. And that's where everything kind of moves forward. So you, uh, but you, you didn't get called into this until what point? Well, no, at that time I was still with the FBI and, and would be for another two and a half years. Right. right. Uh, well, um, after the, uh, the, the first trial, um, there, there were uh, three motives and this, this is, um, was consistent uh, uh, throughout at least the latter two motives. With, but um, Stan Faith was the first uh, prosecutor. Uh, Stan Faith had arrived on the uh, at the crime scene uh, within an hour or so uh, of the uh, state police, and he immediately made a decision to call a um, forensics expert, that uh, blood expert, with whom he had worked before. That was Rod Engler. Uh, and he did so the next day. And Rod Engler, uh, as I recall, was uh, uh, teaching, uh, and this would have been a Friday, and said he couldn't make it. But nonetheless, uh, he would send his protege, uh, a fellow by the name of Rob Stites. Uh, and so Rob Stites arrived the, uh, the next day, which would have been Saturday, September 30th of 2000. And uh, he immediately went to the uh, uh, Kentucky Medical Examiner's Office in Louisville, where the autopsies had been accomplished and the victims were still there. And he did uh, several measurements and took additional photographs. And then uh, went to the crime scene where he was given uh, carte blanche uh, access to everything. And then the next day he went to the Sellersburg State Police Post where he was given uh, total access to the clothing uh, worn by David. David voluntarily given up his clothing uh, the night of, or at least early morning of, uh, the murders. Uh, I, I should also mention at this time that that Kim had a, a total of 22 uh, bruises, contusions, um, uh, lacerations uh, on her body from her chin literally down to the tops of her feet. Uh, both feet had been I, I think a, a, a good deduction would have been, uh, well, they certainly were traumatized, but stomped on uh, because there were um, small lacerations on the tops of, of each foot. So, uh, and you know, certainly one uh, medical examiner, and she also had uh, bruising to the elbows. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it was a pretty clear indication that Kim had fought viciously with her attacker, including or having one fingernail ripped off. Right. And, and uh, yeah. Yeah. And there's a couple of other important pieces there. And one is that Kim's shoes were neatly placed on top of this Bronco. It's just, it's, you can see, and, and she's a, she's a small lady. She's very short. And, and these things are up on top of the, the yeah, Bronco, Bronco very neatly placed. A large vehicle. Uh, right. And it, a, a lot of things are unexplained at the time. The, uh, uh, the fact that, uh, well, first of all, the, the state police uh, concluded early on that uh, burglary had not been a, a uh, motive because there had been no forced entry to the home, but yet the, the home wasn't locked. Uh, right. And that was a tough one. to. Uh, and then they claimed that uh, she, there was no sexual attack on her, even though she was missing her, uh, her pants. And uh, uh, that, that how they concluded that, I think, was because they had reached another conclusion and that they had concluded that Dave had been responsible for this and that the sexual attack on Kim had been staged, uh, quote unquote, uh, and that there were, um, uh, there, there were other quick conclusions. Uh, uh, Jill on the, uh, the Friday after the Thursday night murders, uh, her autopsy had been conducted and it became rather clear uh, uh, early on, just from a, a physical uh, uh, eyesight examination of the body, uh, that she had some kind of trauma to uh, her exterior, uh, exterior, external, I should say, uh, genitalia. Um, and, but that was misclassified as, as injuries to her vagina, which was not accurate. Uh, and then in the probable cause affidavit, that was quote unquote, consistent with sexual intercourse uh, that the, the medical examiner said that 
Jill had nonspecific blunt force trauma, and that's what it was. And it could have been uh, uh, that those injuries could have occurred through any number of reasons or uh, sources. Um, later on, I, I I think we concluded the uh, the most probable source, but but there was no evidence that it was molestation. Number one, and certainly certainly no evidence whatsoever that those injuries, whatever they were, uh, have been uh, uh, caused by her father. Uh, yeah. But nonetheless, that, that came out early, and, and that was one of the, uh, uh, the motives that uh, Prosecutor Faith argued at the first trial. And then he had also argued that, that there was a, uh, and, and indeed Kim had a sizable amount of insurance, but, but she was uh, doing well financially. And uh, uh, the last insurance changes had occurred a couple months before, and she had been the one who implemented those changes. But most of all, on Dave, had lost a large uh, three hundred thousand dollar policy with the state police, a group policy. So, so Kim was the financial wizard. She knew what she was doing, uh, and she was the one who had uh, 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 implemented all of these uh, changes. And then the third motive uh, that Faith argued was that. Dave, who had uh, engaged in affairs before, several years before, that he was uh, wanted a free lifestyle, and therefore uh, uh, that was allowed. Uh, the first judge erroneously allowed him to bring in women with whom Dave had affairs before, and uh, it was nothing more, nothing less than the character assassination. And, yeah. and uh, uh, a non-legal term, which I use, is... Uh, uh, he cheated, and the uh, judge let him get away with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you had mentioned about uh, Stan Faith calling in the bloodstain experts, and you know that uh, on David's T-shirt, when you know he goes in and he pulls out. Uh, I mean, he's in a, a crime scene; it's got blood everywhere. So naturally, if he's he's moving around, he moves inside the the Bronco. He pulls Brad out, brings him out to the garage floor. So. Uh, naturally, he's going to have some blood on him, but it's it's determined that by the experts that there are you know just a, a several stains on the lower uh, left part of his T-shirt that you know could have only come from what they're calling high velocity you know back spatter or whatever. So he had to be present when the gun was fired. How important was that evidence in in the you know things tilting against David Cam's favor? Well, well, let let me give you a little backdrop on that first to you, Jane. Because Rob Stites went and, and he, he examined this this uh, uh, T-shirt on Sunday morning, October 1st. Before he went in there, he was told, uh, he thought by Prosecutor Faith, that Dave was the shooter uh, and or the suspect. And indeed, on his notes, he's got examination of suspect's T-shirt. So... So his mind has already been placed in a, hey, you're going to be looking at a, a T-shirt, uh, which belonged to the shooter slash suspect. Th that might have uh, tainted uh, some findings. I, at least I think it's certainly possible. But uh, the T-shirt the of David's, uh, which, as you suggest, the lower left front in an area which was later designated as uh, Area 30, he had eight tiny stains, four of which were on the hem itself and four just uh, on top of that. And within a matter of 15 minutes, and I've always thought this was uh, unique, uh, Stites found within 15 minutes that those were HVIS, high velocity impact spatter or blowback. Uh, and yet it, in the subsequent years, there's been several hundred thousand dollars uh, spent in examinations by at least 11 different experts. And that was, by the way, that turned out to be Five said it was spatter. Five said it was uh, contact. One said it was spatter. Then he said he didn't know. So, you know, we've got 50-50, uh, literally a toss of the coin, as Stacy Uliana uh, would say. And Stacy's one of the, the, the two appellate attorneys and uh, one of Dave's uh, uh, defense attorneys in trials two and three. Uh, so early on, he's told that this is a shooter suspect. And within 15 minutes, he says, oh, yeah, that's uh, HVIS. Now, later on, now this, this is interesting, too. Later on that Sunday, uh, one of the interviewing uh, officers, uh, Mickey Neal, uh, state police detective, uh, he, he's feeling a little uh, 
not all that confident that in in this expert's opinion. So he stops the uh, he stops his part of the interview of David interrogation and goes and talks to Stites. He says, "How how uh, sure are you?" And uh, Stites says, "According to Neil, about eighty percent." He says, "Ninety percent." And he goes, uh, that's not good enough for me. So now then we have two disparate stories here. Stite says he calls uh, Rod Englert and describes to him over the phone without Englert ever seeing these stains, what he had. And Englert said, yeah, that's what you got, HVIS. Englert later on says, no, that would never happen. I, I never would uh, offer an opinion over the phone without seeing something. But nonetheless, Stites goes back in to uh, Neil, he says, I'm, I'm sure, I'm positive. So uh, now we have, and, and Stites not only uh, offered that opinion on the HVIS, but he said that uh, the blood flow from Kim's head wound, uh, that a, a cleaning solution was added to that, that the cleaning solution was then later thrown over the back deck, uh, and you could see the spots, and that uh, a mop in the laundry room smelled of bleach, inferring that well, that was the uh, that was the issue there that they used a mop. It, it was never explained to me by anyone at any time why in the hell or what the purpose if, if that ever happened what what good it would have done to to add something to the blood flow. I, when I first saw it, I was pretty sure I knew what it was, but I wanted to verify that. And, and indeed, it was blood serum separation, which lit that was a forensic cause of looking at and saying, well, no, no. David Cam, according to the first problem life of David, left the ball games at, and arrived home at 925. And that's when the first af, uh, allegation was the first affidavit. That's when he shot and killed his wife and kids. When, of course, blood serum doesn't separate in a matter of a few minutes. It takes a while and certainly depending upon any number of other conditions. But but uh, and that was well over an hour that it would have taken. Uh, and it was then, and not only that, but the first uh, lead detective had it all wrong. Uh, he said that Dave left about nine o'clock. That 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 was woefully wrong. And they had known, they had interviewed all the uh, basketball players by that time and were. Uh, uh, detective Clemens got that information. I have no idea. And then he said that uh, a neighbor heard at 915 three sounds that could be interpreted as gunshots i.e. that Dave had gotten home and that's when he killed the family. And that was that was totally wrong, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so then after Dave's arrest and after the Louisville area has been plastered with all this information about Dave Cam probably uh, molesting his daughter and yada, 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 all this assassination of characters occurred, uh, then it dawns on the prosecutor this is not right. We didn't, it didn't happen after the ball games. It happened during the ball games. Now, what the hell are you going to do? Well, so the prosecutor going to say, uh, you know, uh, press conference, uh, I wanted to tell you that, uh, uh, geez, we got it wrong. Uh, and if you do that, you're also going to say, mm, there's, there's a killer out there. Mm -hmm. Or what are you going to do? And that stay quiet, which is what they did. And, uh, very quietly changed the the time of the murders as to the time that Dave was playing basketball with uh, 11 other people or with 10 other people. And uh, actually there were two spectators, one of whom died before the state police ever got to interviewing. But uh, yeah, I want, I want to ask you about the, well, I think I may want to circle back on the investigation part and the interviews with the, cause he's Dave's got, he's got 10, 11 alibis there. Right. So, um, and what happened there. But there's another piece of evidence that was really important, and that was the sweater. There's this sweater that's at the crime scene. Well, well a sweatshirt, yes. A sweatshirt, excuse me, a, yes. a sweatshirt. And uh, on the inside back, it's, you know, it's somebody's written backbone. And right. that we've we've come to find out is the nickname uh, or uh, either uh, given to him or I think probably self-proclaimed nickname of uh, Charles Bonnet. What, right. what, what I don't understand is uh, what took so long to get the sweater analyzed for DNA. I mean, this is this we're talking 2000. The the DNA came back when like Okay, uh, and, and let me uh, give you the background. Uh, yeah. The uh, the the sweatshirt, a uh, gray sweatshirt, uh 
was on the floor other in the darkened garage. Uh, according to the uh, the chief uh, evidence tech, it had, quote, gotten away from the state police and had actually been placed in the same body bag as, as um, had been uh, uh, Brad placed. Uh, and so it was recovered at the Kentucky Medical Examiner's Office. It was indeed subjected to DNA analysis. And, and the state police lab in Evansville, uh, Lynn Scamhorn uh, did a very, very good job. Uh, Diane Tolliver did a wonderful job. The, the state um, fire exam, uh, uh, firearms examiner, Ed Wessel, great job. Uh, the, the fingerprint uh, examiner, John Singleton, all great, great work. They let the evidence do the talking. Uh, that didn't translate to other aspects of the investigation. But, but the, the sweatshirt, uh, Lynn finds uh, uh, Kim's DNA on, on a sleeve, which would indicate that that was part of the fight and certainly the bloody fingernail. Uh, and there was unidentified uh, female DNA also on the sweatshirt. Uh, Mike McDaniel, the, uh, the first um, defense attorney, he sends a sweatshirt out to Orchid Cellmark, and they find, lo and behold, in that backbone uh, hand imprinted uh, name and the collar, they find some cellular uh, DNA. And uh, it comes back to unidentified male DNA. Well, Mike thinking that, hey, th this is a linchpin to the solution of this case, he uh, asked Faith, the prosecutor, to run it through CODIS, the National DNA Database. And two weeks later, Faith says, I ran that DNA through the database. This is a couple months before the first trial. And he says, and there was no matches. And so, okay, so uh, Mike goes to trial, and he, he tries to uh, still bring up this sweatshirt as a possible uh, garment left by the real killer. Uh, and he's ridiculed, of course, by Stan Faith. Fast forward in 2002, uh, when he's convicted, 2004 in August, the, the uh, convictions are overturned. And that's when uh, Kitty, Lyle, and Stacey Uliana, uh, and then later me, uh, formed the defense team. And um, uh, one of the first things we said, we've got to get this sweatshirt tested again, or at least uh, the DNA uh, try and match uh, the unknown male and female uh, because there may have been uh, some uh, additions to the uh, coded database. Well, lo and behold, uh, and of course, the second prosecutor, Keith Henderson, he was very, very slow in doing this. And finally, Kitty was forced to uh, say, hey, if you don't do it, I'm going to get a court order. And so Henderson finally does it, but not until two weeks later after the results come back, is she notified, Kitty notified, and that's by a reporter right. who's been tipped off with a scoop by Henderson. Well, that, that the DNA comes back to Charles Darnell Bonet, who's an 11-time convicted felon, uh, 10 convictions uh, of crimes against women, violent crimes, attacking them at night. And this would fall under the category, I think, of a clue that he had, uh, the first five women he had attacked he had uh, tackled him, caused bruising uh, at night near a car and had stolen one item, a shoe. Uh, he was stealing shoes from these female victims uh, as trophies. Well, recall the, the shoes on top of the Bronco. Some people may, you know, bring those two together. Uh, that didn't happen with the second investigation. Uh, also, uh, Bonet had engaged in two armed robberies, actually there were three, two of which he had been charged, whereas women were again targeted, and he tried to abduct all of them. The last uh, home invasion was an armed robbery of three IU Indiana University co-eds, uh, where after he had uh, stolen their money and uh, literally taken them around the, this condo, gun to the back of the head, holding their hair, uh, threatening to blow their fucking brains out, uh, and uh, later he, he didn't get enough money and all during this time his, uh, he, he's getting more and more in a frenzy according to the three victims and, and then finally takes him out to the car is going to take him to an ATM machine where all three said we, we knew we we're going to be it, it, it wasn't going to end well uh, mm -hmm. fortunately a neighbor had seen some of this uh, Bloomington police officers Matt Morris and George Conley arrived uh, arrested Bonet at gunpoint and uh, 
so then he gets a 20 year sentence in 1992 uh, for 1993 for his 1992 crimes. So he's supposed to be released in 2002. Uh, he gets out in June of 2000, two years before, two years early, uh, after a letter writing campaign to the sentencing judge where he claims he's a He's had exemplary uh, behavior and he's yada, yada, yada. And he's also a born again Christian uh, and, uh, and it worked. Uh, and so within, uh, certainly within a short period of time, he's in possession of a gun again. And uh, uh, anyway, so his, his identity and DNA is discovered in February, 2005. And, and that's when the uh, state police and the prosecutor's office say, well, my golly, he told us that he gave this sweatshirt to the Salvation Army, and you can't make this up. And uh, it's not his fault that it fell into the hands of the wrong person. <laughs> right. And, and, it, the and it is, well, they actually went on TV and vouched for him. And, and this is after, you can't make this up either. This is after they gave him a stipulated polygraph and he flunked it about his involvement in the crimes and even a, a, a peak attention test about the murder weapon being a, a 380. And indeed, it was a 380 uh, Lorsen semi-automatic. Um, you can't make that up. But they said, no, uh, we believe him. It's still David Can. That might fall under the uh, category of in blaring neon lights, confirmation bias. Right. Now, you uh, obviously you had interviewed Charles Bonet um, on, uh, well, I, I don't remember the exact date, but, you know, sometime after that, you know, he, he's talking to the, the police, he's talking to the prosecution and, um, you know, they're trying to get information from him. His, his story keeps changing. And I'll tell you what, like when I watch videos of him or I've seen some of the videos of him giving interviews and knowing his backstory, knowing some of the things he, he does, he's creepy to me. Like he, he just comes across like, he, like even on video and stuff, I've never met him face to face, but he just gives me uh, a bad feeling. And I'm wondering about your experience interviewing him and, you know, what you were um, expecting and maybe, you know, what, what st struck you immediately in speaking to him? Yeah. He, uh, yeah, keep in mind, I've, I've interviewed thousands of people over a, um, a total of a 40 year career. Uh, and, and certainly he wasn't the first one who, who fell into the category of what I deem as a, as a true psychopath. Uh, he, uh, uh, Charles, it, it became clear to me, you know, we're talking about the horrific murders uh, of, a, of, of a very protective mother uh, and her five and seven year old uh, children who were assassinated in, in the back seat of the, of the car. And, and I mean, it's, it's about as horrific as it gets. And Charles Bonet is playing games with me. It's obvious. Uh, and his concern is not about the, the, those horrific murders uh, of the five or seven year old child. Uh, it's, it's about playing games and he's, he's playing games with me. And, and, and of course he, he's a pathological liar. I mean, that's, that's who they are uh, because the games they play, it's like, I'm smarter than you and I'm going to show you just how smart I am. And, and with, within the first few minutes, uh, it was obvious, and of course we knew, uh, that, that uh, Bonet had repeatedly lied to me. Uh, he's trying to put the, his best face forward, uh, but at the same time, it, he can't help but brag. For example, he, he's talking about what an exemplary uh, prisoner he was in the Indiana Department of Corrections. And he said, well, you know, I, I, I really did good, and I you know, helped mentor all these people, and yada, 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 and they got their GEDs. And then he has to brag and he says, we well, you know, he says, uh, we also did some other things too. You know, we made hooch, we, we sold drugs, you know, and, and later on when we do get his uh, DOC records, uh, he, he's a, uh, a soldier in one of the uh, prison gangs and he's out threatening to kill people. Uh, and, and it's clear to me, he, he doesn't, he has no conscience. He has no remorse uh, about anything he's done. He says that he does, but he doesn't. Uh, but one thing we, we, uh, I was able to get from him, and as at that time, we were still having uh, other DNA tested blood. Fingerprints had not been uh, compared that had been lifted from the blood scene, including a huge uh, palm print from the left hand on the uh, 
the passenger pillar post. Uh, and I asked him, I said, hey, I said, Charles, if any of that belongs to you, what would that mean? And I said, would it mean that you're at the scene? And he goes, well, yeah. I said, and if you're at the scene, that would mean that you were the shooter. Is that right? He goes, well, that would be obvious. Well, and, and of course, he's confident at that time uh, of the come that there's not going to be anything uh, found there. But four days later and four days after, uh, the prosecutors went on TV proclaiming his innocence and that he had been uh, just a stooge in all of this. The, the palm print does come back uh, from, and as well you know, uh, uh, through your uh, 3D animation, that uh, that palm print was that of Charles Darnell Bonet, where a man who would be stabilizing himself reached into the back seat of that Bronco and cold bloodedly shot to death a five and a seven year old child. Yeah. Ha have you ever seen a case where prosecutors and the police were? Because th there's no other way to say this, but they were helping him. They were coaching him. They were they were. Oh. They were pushing him along to try and steer him to say certain things. Like if you if you listen to the interviews, and by the way, I have to say, like the, the in the book, there's a ton of details about the interviews, and uh, so I had never seen all of that beforehand. So getting access to that and being able to read it was very enlightening. But you know, in these interviews, you're like, how can how why are they saying that? Like they're steering the guy. They're 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 telling him what to say, basically. Um, well. Uh, and, yeah, and see, they, they, they've got a, uh, uh, as one would say, a huge conundrum uh, because they've said all along that it's David Camp. Okay, now you got this, all this evidence. You got this man's very violent background, attacking women at night for their shoes, using a gun, pulling the uh, hair. And by the way, uh, one of the evidence techs said they had never seen so much hair uh, on, on Kim as he had, on, and on her sweater because it had been obviously pulled out. Well, that might be a clue too. Gun to the back of head, blow your fucking brains out. I, I mean, that that could all that could be a clue. And the fact also, he gave me four sets of alibi witnesses where he was that day. At starting at two o'clock, well now, if Kim and the kids weren't killed until we think around seven fifty to eight o'clock that night, why is he starting his alibis at two in the afternoon? Well, a neighbor kid skipped school that day and saw a dark colored Cadillac enter and then leave the dead end Lockhart Road about two o'clock that afternoon. And it clearly was Charles Bonet's uh, vehicle. And there was a, a passenger in the vehicle with him. So he starts his interviews at two o'clock or is it rather his uh, alibis at two o'clock. Well, that would be like for most people a clue also. And then he gives me three other alibis where he was that evening. And of course I interview, you can't make this up either Eugene. Hey, this, this is just nutty. I interview all four of those uh, alibis and they said, well, that's, that's bullshit. That didn't happen, including where he was at the time of the murders. Those alibis, even though they were not documented anywhere on any police report I'd ever seen, nonetheless, we knew that he had given them to him. So, so there's a lot of stuff which hadn't been documented, but yet the investigators didn't contact any one of them any one of them until well after he was arrested. And that was only after his palm print was found. So it, it's, it, they did not want to know. It, it was one of these don't confuse me with the facts routine. It was, um, it was pretty damn sad. Yeah. When it comes to the investigators contacting people and running interviews and such like that, you had, you had a little bit of an issue with the, uh, how they conducted the interviews of the alibis. Can you talk about that? Well, uh, yeah, uh, uh, one of the, uh, if you're talking about Mala Singh, uh, she was- No, no, sorry. I meant, I meant the, uh, I, I didn't mean those alibis. Sorry. I meant David Cam's alibis, the basketball players. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, we sat down early on, Kitty and I sat down with each and every one of them. And, and, and you know, they, keep in mind, they were not alibi witnesses until the, the time of the murders was changed from after the games until during. Well, uh, uh, so- they didn't know how Dave didn't know their alibi witnesses. Uh, so what happens is that we sit down and talk with them and every single one of them is like, why, why are we, we don't have anything to gain by lying. Some of them didn't even know Dave. And so you're going to say that like faith did the first prosecutor, that these people were mistaken at best or liars at worst. How, how do you, how do you come up? It, it's, it's 
they're only liars because you can't accept the fact that David Cam didn't kill his family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it, it was insane. Uh, and but nonetheless, at the first and second trials, those uh, those uh, witnesses were uh, they took the stand, told their story, and the the questioning was, uh, how many points did you score the second game? I, I don't remember. Who did you guard the third game? I don't remember. Did the second game last uh, 13 or 19 minutes? I, I don't know. We, and, and it was like all and on. So they presented this case to the uh, the jury, uh, these witnesses, as confused people. Uh, but how in that, now, now think for a minute, if you've got five on five basketball players, how are you going to have one person leave the gym, leave the game, and not be missed? Well, that's what they said. Well, Dave Cam left and wasn't missed. It's like insane. But, <laughs> but, and, and uh, especially in the second trial, and uh, I saw it up close and personal for damn near nine weeks, uh, Dave Cam, they were allowed to argue, Henry, and Henderson did in final argument, that Dave had molested his daughter. Uh, there's no nexus whatsoever between her injuries and her dad. And uh, it, it was, it, it, once again, uh, the, uh, they were allowed to cheat, and they did. And uh, the jury said, well, hey, uh, we were convinced that he molested his daughter. And so this, this highly inflammatory emotional argument, it trumps the 11 eyewitnesses. And, and, and people say, and I, I initially, I said this when looking at this case. I said, that can't be. I said, come on now, you're telling me that 11 people said they were with him for all this time and and they're still going to convict him uh, yeah and that's what happened and uh, it, it it just it, it really shows um uh, the the gravity of 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 emotion and uh emotion ruled the day in the first two trials very much yeah so. there was uh you mentioned mala singh before and in your book you sort of have, you sort of point to it uh, an interesting theory that you have that she was somehow involved. And I'm just wondering what, what kind of evidence or what kinds of things did you hear that, you know, made you think that, Hey, she, she might've been there. Well, uh, keep in mind, there was unidentified female DNA. Uh, Bone tells the uh, uh, investigators and he tells me uh, that, well, you know, it's certainly possible that that unidentified, and he knew this case forward and backwards and probably had attended uh, uh, some days of the trial. We knew he was in the, uh, courthouse during day's trial the first trial so we and that that would be an indication to me yet again of of a personality that uh was very proud of the fact that he got away with this but uh he tells me he says so uh, did you ever consider that that unknown uh, unidentified female dna might have been uh, belonged to the one who uh helped the killer who was uh, involved in this so that and that that was that's yet another aspect of him playing games. Uh, I, I quite frankly, I use a crasser term. I I I call these people fuckwits because they they like to fuck with you. Mm-hmm. I think that they were brighter. But uh, so he did that not only with me but with uh, the the police investigators. Uh, and then among other things, keep in mind there was uh, the witness who saw the outline of a uh, um, a passenger in the vehicle. We know that Mala was living with uh, Bonet at the time. Her own words placed her with him that day, that night. Uh, and her DNA is indeed discovered, uh, matched finally, as uh, on the same sweatshirt that's got uh, the DNA of her uh, boyfriend and Kim's DNA. Uh, so we've got some pretty good evidence there that, that all of that was... Uh, uh, place there at the same time. Uh, and, and Mala Singh's, she even says in uh, an initial interview that she knew that Charles Bonet had seen uh, Kim and the kids uh, at a store. Uh, the inference was at a store, but that as he, had, he had known of them. And indeed, his residence where he lived with his mother and with Mala was within a few hundred feet of a meat market where Kim's sister uh, had owned and operated with her husband. And Kim had gone there very frequently, uh, also a, a supermarket nearby. So Mollis uh, admits at that time 
then she later backtracks and claims she never said that. But she also makes a comment during a uh, interview with the uh, investigators that I did see uh, uh, the killings. And, and it's like, well, they didn't follow up on that. That's would be like a clue too, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. They didn't follow up on that. And they were giving her, they, they, they told her, hey, all we were trying to do is, is eliminate you, you know. And just like they told uh, Bonet, hey, we need the connection between you and David. And what's Bonet supposed to say? There is no connection, because which there wasn't. And by the way, there was no evidence whatsoever. Uh, cellular phones, records, witnesses, nothing. Among other things, Bonet, when he finally uh, decides to say that, oh, yeah, that he had given a gun to Dave and sold it to him, uh, and he didn't know it was going to be used in the murders, and I'm a big uh, victim here. Uh, one thing he did say that when I first met David playing basketball with 16 to 18 other people at a community park in New Albany. Well, you would think 16 to 18 others, uh, basketball, and this is a, uh, the biggest crime story, I think, uh, the so far certainly of the 21st century in the Louisville area, that you would think that at least one witness would come forward and say, oh, yeah, I was playing in that game or I saw them. There was no witnesses. Uh, and, and once again, there's no corroboration whatsoever to any of Bonet's stories. But uh, back to your question as to uh, Mala's involvement, uh, the, her interviews are replete with uh, information. It, 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 I, I think a decent interrogation would have revealed that she was with him that night. Uh, and she says that he later comes home that night. He's bruised. He's out of breath. He's got a gun. He threatens to kill her threatened to blow her brains out. Well, that's consistent, of course, with what he had done before. Uh, but yet she didn't know anything about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and let, I, I got to tell you here, here's before I, here are the quotes during uh, Bonet's uh, interviews. And I'm not going to say interrogations. He, he was arrested, but it wasn't an interrogation over three or four days. Uh, it was a tutorial in my, at least in my assessment. Here, here's uh Wayne Kessinger, one of the uh, prosecutor's investigators, he tells Boney, this is after Boney tells him of what happened that night uh, and how he got to the cam house and gave him the gun. Uh, Kessinger says, quote, your whole story is screwed up. There's nothing about that story that's believable. How many times are you going to sit and listen to you concoct this story that meets your needs, end quote. And then uh, Gary Gilbert says, you don't have your time straight. There's absolutely no way that David could have met with you at the store, you follow him, and everything else within the time frame. You do know that his alibi that he's using, don't you? He says, all this is bullshit you're talking about, end quote. And then uh, another investigator, uh, Myron Wilkerson, the state police, he says, David Cam does have an alibi. Do you understand? He really does, and that's going to be a problem. He has an alibi that is not matching up with what you're saying. If you're not careful, you're going to be a better witness for him than against him. So that's what they have, and that's what they have at the end of it. And based upon nothing, bullshit, and as one said, a crock of shit, what Henderson later does, a second prosecutor, he charges a conspiracy count between Bonet and Dave. And the conspiracy is that Dave hired Bonet to kill his family. And there's, it's just out yeah. of whole cloth. Yeah, it's crazy because everything about the crime fits Bonet. It fits his character, it fits oh, his yeah. past uh, crimes, uh, everything about it. And so instead of saying, hey, we got the guy, you know, let's celebrate, we got somebody off the streets that is going to potentially do this again. Um, yeah, they, 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 they try to. Well, they try to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak, because they don't want to be proven wrong about David Camp, because then there's going right. to be some. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it brings up an interesting point, though, about the 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 justice system and the fact that prosecutors and things like that, you know, there need to be they're right all the time. And, you know, what what they say goes as opposed to. I, I think what their job should be is really truth finding, you know, is really about, hey, let's let's look at the facts. 
is there, uh, you know, is there a reasonable amount of evidence to, you know, charge somebody with with a crime, and then, you know, then we'll take them to court and let the jury decide. But they 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 tried very hard to prove David guilty, no matter what. And and some of this, like you're saying, is just is just crazy stuff. And and I've never seen a case uh, so fraught with issues like this before. So, um. And it seems to me in reading the book that there was, oh, well, there was clearly tension, obviously, between the prosecution and, and the defense, but it, almost to the point where it was malicious, uh, where, where, you know, they wouldn't be contacted on uh, important evidence, you know, like you said before, uh, when they find out about DNA and things like that, um, uh, Henderson goes to the news before he goes and, and calls the defense about certain things. Right. And did you, was there a lot of this stuff going on? Oh, my gosh, yeah. And uh, there, there certainly is, I, I, I'm confident. Uh, information of, of which we don't know and will never know. Uh, uh, among other things, we were kept in the dark, and this doesn't come out until the, the part two, but I'll tell it to you now, is that Kim and Brad and Joe were buried in Graceland Cemetery in New Albany, a beautiful uh, uh, cemetery, and uh, it's a corner lot, large stone. Well, after uh, Bonet is uh, identified, they actually do put a GPS device on his vehicle. Uh, and this vehicle uh, is uh, tracked into Graceland Cemetery. On the day that Bonet goes into this cemetery, and, and it's not only tracked there, but Dave had been out on bond uh, uniquely for a period of a few weeks and late January to uh, the time of his second arrest in March of 2005. The uh, uh, investigators have placed a, a, a video device uh, and uh, audio device on the on or near the, uh, the stone uh, with the belief that, well, Dave may go there the first time he's been allowed to see, uh, uh, visit his family's grave site, and he would go there perhaps to to apologize or to talk uh, or what have you, and and not not, not a bad piece of uh, uh, investigation, uh, but on the day that and, and Dave doesn't go there by the way, uh, he still I, I don't know if he's ever properly grieved for the loss of his he was of course uh, arrested before uh, the funerals of his family, uh, but the day that uh, Bonet is uh, tracked there on his GPS device. You'd want to say, well, did he go to the grave site? And what did he say? Well, wouldn't you know it, uh, the uh, the audio and the video had failed that day. <laughs> the only time it had failed. You, you, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I get it. I, I, I remember speaking to you before, and I, I remember hearing this story. And it was I was that was one of the ones that I was just absolutely amazed uh, at. But uh, what a coincidence, huh? Yeah. Um, let me well, ask you about the one thing I want to mention too about Mr. Stites. He also had uh, deduced that there was probable blowback on the overhead garage door where uh, above where Kim had been shot, and uh, he had the state police uh, disassemble the uh, uh, the garage door and, and kept as ev evidence. Uh, later on, there was a chemical test uh, 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 conducted out of that, and it was oil based, which meant that, uh, and uh, uh, he later acknowledges that. Well, he thought that the blowback came from Kim Cam's head. Actually, the the blood uh, on the lower left of the T-shirt uh, came from a Jill Cam, and uh, easily, uh, I think, rather easily explained uh, was when Dave went into the car through the between the two bucket seats, placed his left knee on the the bench seat, and grabbed his son, and that was when Jill's head, and certainly where her head was when it. Uh, was when her when she was shot was still upright when uh, uh, Dave had seen her, but then it tilted over to the left once the depression in the seat and her hair was still bloody and the the blood came from the uh, from the bloody ends of her of her uh, hair. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I remember uh, I remember quite extensively doing a lot of the uh, the work on that and trying to reconstruct those events and trying to figure out like what may have happened or whatever. Uh, yeah. Well, on the, just before the, in preparation for the third trial. And right. uh, so that was quite interesting. And, and some of the, the experts that we were uh, dealing with too. So the, 
let, let me, I mean, I, I think people listening to this can, can see that the amount of information and detail there is in this case, it's, it's necessary to have not just one book, otherwise the book would be, you know, really thick. Uh, and so you're definitely working on the second one. When is, when do you expect the second one to be approximately done? Yeah, uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, September of uh, 2023. And, and and one thing I didn't want to be accused of, Eugene, uh, I, I wanted the story to be told. I want it to be uh, detailed, accurate, honest, and and for people to see it. Uh, yes, as some people are never ever going to be convinced uh, of Dave's innocence, but but nonetheless, people with an open mind hopefully will uh, read this, will be amazed, uh, uh, and unfortunately. I think several people will be shocked. Uh, and how how far are you going to go in the second book? Like, how far is it going to cover? Well, it's it's going to cover up until this year, uh, because earlier this year, Dave, uh, as you may recall, uh, was successful civilly in suing uh, the uh, uh, state of Indiana. Uh, I, it's my understanding that his suit against the uh, uh, two um, bloodstain uh, people, uh, Rod Englert and uh, Rob Stites. Uh, had been settled. Uh, there, I believe there's a non-disclosure agreement uh, in that regard. And earlier, a few years back, uh, Dave had settled with the uh, uh, county of uh, 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 Floyd County because uh, there was three entities that were were being sued. And so all of those have been uh, resolved. Excellent. And but yet, but yet, they're, they're, the state of Indiana uh, they deserve scrutiny too in this. Uh, and uh, and we're going to give them that. Okay, I want to show people the uh, the website here, and I want to bring that up because uh, they they may be interested in looking at this more closely. Um, so it's uh, www.theirbloodylies.com, and this is where they can order the book through. Correct? Yeah, you can actually just davidcam.com, and that'll uh, in your uh, uh, search engine, and that should jump you up there uh, to that. Uh, and it gives you some uh, video, gives you a snippet of. Uh, my video with uh, uh, Charles Bonet, uh, also with the uh, prosecutors uh, after Bonet has been identified. Um, you also have, I, I've, I've included in our chapter five, which uh, articulates the evidence such as it was, uh, which caused the arrest of uh, uh, David um, uh, within three days of this horrific crime. Yeah, actually, under the uh, on the inside look, um, when you go to that page where it says the discovery, uh, there's a little uh, audio file here. It says Dave's uh, state police call. Listen to that call, and and uh, it's it's really interesting because and somebody had mentioned this to me, and they said when you listen to Dave on that call, it's very difficult to hear a person who's trying to fake it. It sounds as about as a th it's it's an authentic call. A person is extremely distressed. And, uh, you know, people can go there and they can they can listen to them themselves and make their own mind up. Uh, Gary, so if somebody wants to contact you, I can see here there's a uh, let's see. Is there an email? Oh, there's something down here. So, yeah, it says uh, cam bloody lies at Gmail dot com. So people can reach you through there. Oops, I think I lost you. Hey, you there? I may have lost him. Let me see here. Oh, he's flipped and he's frozen. So I don't know if he's he's still there. Maybe he'll bounce back in in a second. But anyway, I, I'm pretty sure that they can reach you. Um, I, I, I believe I've asked him before. Uh, here where it says camboodylies uh, at gmail.com. I believe you can get uh, I believe you can get access to uh, Gary that way. And so, yeah, unfortunately, he's dropped off and that hasn't happened very much. But let me say a big thank you to Gary if he's... Uh, Hopefully he'll he'll pop back on here in a second, but if not, uh, I want to say thank you to him. Uh, he's done a great job here on the book. A uh, lot of good detail here. If you're interested in the David Cam case, uh, definitely pick it up, have a look. And folks, uh, I want to thank you. And so uh, let me uh, let me get going here. The only last thing that I wanted to say was don't forget about the Forensic Photography Symposium. Uh, that is coming up. It's just around the corner. And on that one, let me just bring up the link again. It's www.ai2 3d.com slash FPS. Okay. Well, look, folks, I want to say thank you very much. Um, oh, wait, let me see if Gary's back in here. Hey, you back, Gary? Oh, he's got no audio. Let me see. 
I think he's having a little bit of a technical problem there. I don't know, Gary, can you hear? Nah, I can't, I can't hear you, Gary. So I'm afraid uh, something's going on with your audio or something happened with the internet here. <laughs> I can't hear you. Yeah. Oh, well, we're out of here. Well, look, Gary, I, I said it before, Gary, I'll say it again. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. The book is great. I really enjoyed it. All the extra detail and everything else uh, was great. I'll be looking forward to the second book. And uh, look, all I can say is uh, thank you very much. And we'll see you soon. Uh, folks, I think this is the last one for the year. Uh, we're going to be starting up again next year with Forensics Talks. So uh, Gary, hang back. I'll, I'll see if I can get you uh, your audio working. But everyone else, hey, have a wonderful holidays. And uh, we'll see you in 2023. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.